Glad you guys are all here. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Mark chapter 3. I missed you guys last week. I know you guys did not miss me, but, uh, <laughs> but I did miss you. So um, While you're flipping over to Mark chapter 3, let me ask you a question, okay? Do any of you wonder how in the world you became so normal growing up in a family full of crazy people? <laughs> yeah? Anybody else? Okay. I'm glad I'm not the only one, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, well... Uh, Jesus also, also, uh, is, is, we're in good company with him because he knows what it's like to have his family uh, think that he's crazy. Let's look at this together. Um, in verse 20 of Mark chapter 3, it says, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out and, to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes came down from Jerusalem, were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of the demons, he casts out the demons, or by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If the kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house is not able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he indeed may plunder the house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man and whatever blasphemes they utter, but whoever's blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an internal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came to him, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, You, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus is very, it's very interesting. Um, he experiences what many of us experience. Those of you who know my eight-year-old daughter, Zoe, uh, probably do not find it surprising that often uh, when speaking to her brothers and also speaking to her parents and speaking to her sister, that she will regularly ask all of us, are you guys out of your mind? Um, and so we, we laugh it off and we think that, you know, it's pithy and fun and she's spunky and she's got that drive and that fire, you know, and all that stuff. But I guarantee you in a culture where people walked around demon possessed, uh, that was not necessarily the most uh, fun loving way to talk about your family. <laughs> and, uh, and so Jesus's brothers and mom think he's out of his mind, think he's crazy. And this points to a truth that his mom and his brothers didn't believe in him. At least not yet. At least not yet. And, uh, but there is, this, there is this thing that then happens where the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, which you already know, they, they're not big fans of Jesus, right? We learned that in chapter two, that because Jesus doesn't fit inside of their framework. He doesn't fit inside of their mold. He doesn't fit inside of the, the system that they want him to fit inside of. He pushes the boundaries of those things as a rabbi, but also, I mean, much less the Messiah. And so they begin to say, well, we got to do away with this guy. He's, a, he's attracting a following. He's attracting too many people. And, and th this is no good. This is no, because he just doesn't fit. And so they, they say that he is Beelzebul. They start giving him labels. They start putting names on him. And, and this is just a way of saying that he's been possessed by the archdemon Beelzebub. And, uh, and that is how he's doing all of these miraculous signs and wonders that he's performing is because he's, because he's demon-possessed. And, and I love how Jesus answers this, uh, this statement from the scribes and Pharisees because he doesn't go to name-calling. He doesn't go to labeling. He doesn't go to, like, any of these conventional forms of, like, when somebody says something to me, I'd say it back. You know, he just, he just, just 
completely debunks their argument by talking about how stupid it is. Uh, and so uh, this, is, this is what he says in verse 23. He says, And he called him and said to them in a parable, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not stand. And so Jesus, in this, this verses, he says, Satan against himself, right? If Satan is against Satan, it, Satan can't stand. Um, the, the word that is translated Satan here is actually in the Greek, it would be the accuser, the accuser. And so it's like, it's like Jesus saying, how could the accuser stop the accuser? If accusation is his job, if his job is to accuse, why would he want to stop accusing? Doesn't make sense. And then he uses this idea of a kingdom, and he says, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Now, there are two things that he's talking about here. Obviously, he's talking about uh, Satan's kingdom, but he's also, I think, drawing a connotation to a word that we've heard thrown around in the first couple chapters of this book thus far, which is that Jesus has come to preach and teach about the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom of God that comes and is in Christ himself. So when he starts talking about a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand, and he's one coming to proclaim the kingdom of God has arrived, and then you have these scribes and these Pharisees who think that they are upholding the kingdom of God, he's saying if we're divided, one of these kingdoms is going to fall. One of these kingdoms is not going to stand. And we know what kingdom stands, don't we? Because you and I sit here now in this place worshiping Jesus whose kingdom is still standing. The made up kingdom of the scribes and the Pharisees or the powerful kingdom of Jesus Christ. So, so he's saying, hey, if my kingdom is truly not the kingdom of God, it will fall but it doesn't fall. It keeps going and will never fall. He says the gates of hell will never prevail against it. He also uses this idea of a house divided, which makes sense because he's gonna deal with his family here in this, this, uh, this chapter and in this section and how a, a house that's divided against itself uh, cannot stand, how a family cannot stand um, when it's divided. We'll look more about that in just a minute. But he continues in verse 26 and says, And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds up the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit has, uh, never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So he, he just says, look guys, Satan rising up against himself means Satan's going to fall. Doesn't really make sense. He's like, come on, don't be so stupid. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a stupid way to look at it. But then he continues and he talks about a strong man will have to be bound up if you want to plunder the strong man's house. You have to bind up the strong man. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give you two interpretations. One is just my personal interpretation from reading the text, and one is from like studying and and, uh, and, and that it was, it was that, that interpretation of like when I went to some commentaries and stuff like that, they presented a different argument uh, for why um, he uses this parable about a strong man. Uh, many scholars will say the reason why he talks about the strong man is because back in uh, Mark chapter one, John the Baptist said, there is one who is coming who is stronger than I. And so what he's doing is he's referring to himself, that he is that strong man in the story and you will have to bind him up uh, good luck, by the way, uh, bind him up and, and in order to plunder his house, in order to bring his kingdom down, in order to bring his house down that he is building. You're going to have to bind him up first. And they tried. They tried. 
And three days after they thought that they had victory, he showed them what real victory looks like. Amen? And so, so this is what happens uh, when you try to bring down God's kingdom. It just comes back with more force and more life and more hope and more freedom. And, uh, and so that's, that's one interpretation. My interpretation is similar but different. Um, it, it, I think it comes to the same ends. It just, I got there differently than where these scholars kind of laid it. And what I thought he was talking about by the strong man is I thought he was talking about Satan. I mean, he's been talking about Satan this entire time. And if you don't think Satan is strong, you are, you are mistaken. <laughs> Satan is extremely powerful and extremely strong and has a stronghold in this world. And he has a kingdom, uh, a kingdom of darkness. And what I think Jesus is referring to, or what I thought Jesus was referring to as I read this, the way I interpreted it was Jesus is saying, uh, you must first bind up the strong man if you want to plunder his house. And that Jesus, by his uh, ability to withstand the temptations of the desert and the wilderness, his ability to, his ability to cast out demons, his ability to, to show and control the kingdom of darkness, he has shown that he has bound up Satan and that he is the stronger man who can do such a thing. And in him, there is true freedom brought to the captive. That's the way I looked at it. I looked at it that like Jesus is binding up Satan and bringing his kingdom of darkness to an end. Amen. And hopefully we believe that this morning. Hopefully we, we, we buy into that argument this morning. Hopefully we find hope in that this morning because if we don't, right, Jesus says what might be our end and that it won't be a good end. Right? He says basically that these men and even his family, they are attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to demon possession. And he, he's, he's speaking in a way and he's saying, look, you can deny the work of the Holy Spirit all you want, but those who do, it will not be a happy ending for them. And it will not be a happy ending for you. Now, it would seem even so much so that Jesus believes that this blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, you could, you could separate this sin away from all the rest. Because all the rest can be forgiven. But this one can't be, according to what Jesus says here. Whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit has no forgiveness, has, 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 is guilty of eternal sin. So what does that mean for you and me? Because I hope that we don't want to get caught in that, in that category, right? Like, if, if that's true, we don't want to find ourselves in that category. Well, here's, here's what I think that that means. We need to be very, very careful with how we place our determinations on what is of God and what isn't of God. We have to be very, very careful to let our own self-righteous and self-confident ideas, views, and opinions be the hill we choose to die on when it comes to the work of God. If we have taken time to investigate the word of God, and we have tested something that we have heard said that we did not believe was true, we've tested it against the word of God and we've been able to find that, then yeah, speak up. Like, that, hey, that's not of God. That's not of the spirit. God's not doing that. But we better investigate it if we have questions. We better test it. So whether you hear something from me or anyone else, if you hear something that's false, say something, but you better have investigated it first. You better have come with, with, with understanding what really God is doing and what God isn't doing if you're gonna make those claims. Because you don't want to stand against the things that God is doing by his spirit. 
You don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit in this way. And this is really, really difficult, in a, in a, especially in a Christian culture where it's really easy to chalk up any decision we make as, well, we felt like God was telling us to do it. Oh, I just felt like, you know, God was, was moving me in that direction. I really felt, you know, like we use God as a defense for really selfish things sometimes. And it's not... It's not, the, the things that, that I've heard people say, well, you know, just felt like this is what God was telling us to do. And I'd be like, I don't think God tells anybody to do that. In fact, I think God tells most people to do the opposite. That, that, that is, that's a, that's a problem. Here's, 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 a, here's a maybe more tangible example. It is really hard to endure suffering. And some of you have suffered more than I ever will. You've experienced a, a certain level of suffering that I will never understand. But in this life, we will all suffer. And if the answer to your suffering is going, well, I think God's telling me to run as far as I can from that suffering... That's not the Holy Spirit at work in your life. Because the word of God actually says, may we endure suffering. Because in doing so, it produces something in us that makes us more like Jesus. Because if Jesus was anything, it was a suffering servant. Is, that, is it tangible enough? And I know it's uncomfortable but when we just choose to run and go, yeah, I feel like God's calling me to go in this other direction. We use God as a defense to run from the hard stuff. I don't, I don't know if that's actually the work of the Holy Spirit. I think that might just be you running from discomfort. So we gotta be careful. Gotta be careful not to find ourselves in that category because there's no coming back from that category. Here's uh, uh, how Jesus ends this section. Verse 31, he says, And his mother and his brothers came and were standing outside, and they sent and they called him. And the crowd standing around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. So his response to his family when they come looking for him is, who are my mother and brothers if they're not the ones sitting around this table right now with me? Who, who, who is my family if it's not these people? He's saying, my family are those that are with me right now, that are around the table and in the room. That's my family. Now, church, do me a favor. Whatever else might grab your attention for the next 12 seconds, just look at me real cl closely, okay? Because I think this is really, really important what I'm about to say next. In God's kingdom... In, in, in the kingdom of Jesus, there is a family, and it seems to maybe the kingdom at all is a family that's closer than blood. And that is a really, really significant truth that we should understand. For Jesus to have said this in a culture in a Jewish culture, where being a part, a descendant of whoever, right? Son of whatever, daughter of whoever. Like, that was everything. And to be a Jewish son was to take your bloodline all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the people of God. I mean, it was significant to, 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 to like dissect yourself away from that group of people and say that, oh, no, 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 this is my family. It's not just my bloodline. This is my family. That's a significant thing that Jesus is saying. 
It's a, like, it is a, it is a, it is, it is something Jesus is saying that we should not miss and we should not take for granted. Now, many of us, right, we grow up in this Western world where many of us live hundreds of thousands of miles away from our brothers and sisters and our parents, right? Um, and, and it's not really as big of a deal. It's not really as foreign of an idea for us to not be right there with them all the time and, and those kinds of things. In Jesus' culture, it was, it was just unheard of. But everyone that he calls, think about it. Peter and Andrew, come follow me. And what do they have to leave? Their family. James and John, who's fishing with them when Jesus says, come follow me? Their dad, their sons of Zebedee. He, Jesus is inviting his followers into a new family. But in order to take hold of the invitation, they have to leave their family of origin behind and embrace this new family of Jesus. Mallory and I, we've been married for 15 years. We've done ministry in five different states at five different churches in that 15 years. I know you guys, what you're thinking is like, wow, that's like three years, uh, and you've been here at least three. So, uh, no, I'm, so, I plan on staying for a really long time here, okay? Just so y'all know. Um, unless y'all kick me out. Um, so here, here uh, which you can try. You can try. All right. All uh, right. <laughs> What we realized about the third state that we ended up in, we realized that it really doesn't matter where you live. What matters is what people are where you live. It doesn't really matter where your address is if there are good people who love you and that you love close by. And that is a powerful, powerful truth. And many of you in the room, you know this truth because you've been a part of Lake Springs and Lake Springs has been that for you. I could say Lake Springs has been that for me. You know, uh, holidays are pretty lonely times for pastors. I don't know if you guys know that and I'm not saying this to get a pity party, right? But holidays are, are lonely because we happily are here serving on Christmas and Easter and all of these kinds of things and we aren't usually able to be with our family. And, uh, and again, I say we are happily here serving because that's what we feel like God's called us to do. Like we love doing it. Um, but, but many other people get to spend the holidays with their families. It's not as easy for us. Um, and uh, but, I, but when I first moved here uh, six years ago, has it been six years ago? Wow. Um, so six years ago, uh, it was Easter Sunday. It was our first Easter at this church. And, um, and we didn't know very many people yet. Like, I mean, we just didn't know very many people. We, we were brand new to the area. Um, and, you know, I'm up here preaching, but, you know, building relationships, but don't really have any deep relationships yet. And uh, it's Easter, and we don't really have any plans after church because our family's not around, and, and we're not going to be doing anything with our family like most people on Easter Sunday afternoon. Um, and then Lynn and Wydell Fleming said, hey, Derek, why don't you and Mallory and the kids, why don't you come over for lunch on Easter, you know, if you don't have any other plans? And they invited us to come sit at their table with their family, with their daughter and their son-in-law and our family, just have Easter lunch. Just show up. Don't have to bring anything. Don't have to do anything. Just come. Be a part of that. And Lynn and Wydell, and, and we were not close at that point. We didn't have a deep relationship. Like I said, we, we just barely knew each other. But they invited us in. And since then, we have built, like, such a strong, loving relationship with them. We celebrate Christmas with the Flemings just like we do with our regular family. Like, we go over to their house and we open presents just like we do with my mom and my dad and Mallory's parents, like, because we're family. And whether Mallory and I live in Holly Springs, North Carolina or not, like, we will always make time to like be with the Flemings for the rest of our life because they're family. 
that's, that's what the church is supposed to be. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. It's about the fact that you and I have been invited into this new family of Jesus and, and those who are around him and those who are at his table and who come to his table have an opportunity to look across the table at one another and see that we are family, not united because of our bloodline, but united because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so no matter how rich or how poor or how old or how young, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're, you're Latino or, 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 or Asian, it does not matter. You and I, if we call on the name of Jesus as, and plead the blood of Jesus over our life because of our sins, we are now invited into this new family of Jesus. And I know we conceptually understand this. I know that there is a global church and there is going to be a vast number of people in heaven. But can I speak for a second about the fact that where that puts us right now, one day we will worship with all the saints. But right now, we are here worshiping with these saints. In every building across the United States and across the world that gathers under the name of Jesus today, it should feel like a family. So why doesn't it? If this is what we're invited into... Why is it so often that it doesn't feel like family? Why is it so often we won't go to any links in order to love one another and serve one another and care for one another? Why is it that we won't go to any links to settle disputes with one another? Why isn't it that we won't go to any lengths to laugh with one another and mourn with one another? This is what it means to be a family. Can I just, can I just say that like, I think one of the major issues is that we think that we've come to church today. We woke up this morning and we said, I'm going to go to church today. Do you realize church is not a place that you go? It's a people and a family you belong to. We have to stop thinking about church as an event that we attend on a Sunday morning. That when we leave, we're supposed to be all happy and ready for the week ahead. We need to start thinking about the church as brothers and sisters united by the blood of Christ that we do life with. We bear one another's burdens and we care deeply for one another and that all of us are growing in unison toward Christ. That's what the church should be. But we have to stop thinking about it as something that we just show up to on a weekend and then walk out of. We have to start thinking about it as a family. Or else we might miss the work that the Holy Spirit is doing and wants to do. Now, let me say this. I have no problems if people want to come into this family on a Sunday morning and worship here and lift their voices and sing because they are sons and daughters. But my prayer is, is that every son and daughter that comes in here and worships here on a Sunday morning will, will not just show up at an event, but will actually be a part of the church and be a part of the family. Because until we are a part of a church 
and a part of a family. I don't, I don't know if we've accepted the true invitation that Jesus offers and that Jesus extends. I'm afraid we are just consumers taking in a product that we like. I don't think that's what the church is supposed to be. Now, it is an invitation, though. No one is making anybody do anything. See, Jesus, he extends an invitation to a lot of people, and only very few actually accept it. Thousands and thousands of people are mesmerized by Jesus. They love Jesus. They think he's great. They're like, man, what he can do, it's incredible. You should see this guy. He's awesome. Like, y'all want to come see? He'll heal somebody today. Just come watch him. He'll do it. It's awesome. It's great. It's, it's amazing. Oh, man, you want to hear a great sermon? Man, go listen to that guy, Jesus. He's usually on, you know, that mountain over here. It's about three miles east. Let's go take a walk, you know? But let's go listen to him because his sermons are just so incredible. And thousands and thousands of people would flock to him for healing and hear his teaching and all those kinds of things. But when it was all said and done, there was 120 that were left. Actually, his disciples. 120. That means his church was smaller than ours. He was the savior of the world and could do far more things than I can do and preach far better sermons than I can preach. <laughs> he had 120. Because he extended a lot of invitations to people and people said, well, let me go bury my father first. Which was a first century way of saying, let me go home and wait till my dad dies and then I get his inheritance and then I'm independently wealthy and then I'll come follow you. There were a lot of people who Jesus extended an invitation to and they just said, no, it's just the cost is not, I'm, I'm not willing to give that up to be a part of that family, to be a part of that community, to be a part of that church. But it's an invitation. The question is, what is it worth to you? And maybe it's not worth it. That's okay. But I hope it will be. And my prayer is that it will be. My prayer is that you and I will become a, a family closer than blood. Closer than blood. Because we share the blood of Jesus Christ. Because that is our mark of hope in life and that's what makes us family you know every week we we take communion together um, and I like referring to it as the table the reason why I like referring to it as the table is because I believe that this is where Jesus' closest companions met him he met them around a table he had meals with them he loved them he broke bread with them. And so we do this every week to remind ourselves that we are not saved by anything that we have done. We are not saved because we are good people and have it figured out. If you are a part of this family long enough, you'll realize we are not good people and we do not have it figured out. But we come around the table because he loved us enough that while we were still sinners he died on the cross for our sins and he bought us he adopted us and made us his sons and made us brothers and sisters with the, with the payment of his blood and so we come to the table every week not every church does this but we do it every week because we want to be reminded that this is, the, this is what makes us the church this is what makes us family 
So as you come to the table today, I want you to know you've been invited. You've been invited into a family because of the broken body and because of the shed blood of Jesus. And as you take, maybe think about how you might share, love, care for, serve. How you might laugh with, mourn with, settle disputes with this amazing family that Jesus has brought together here in Holly Springs. But also maybe it's a time to just sit and repent and confess that, man, I haven't taken this seriously enough. I haven't really, truly given my whole self to this family. The family that you died for. The family that you came to save.